Hello everyone. Um, my name is Claudia Tazrata. I am an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And this talk is focused on Australia's refugee policy. Um, and I'm going to uh, tease apart how we can understand um, the most recent incarnation of Australia's refugee policy, where Australia has um, instituted approaches and policies and laws that mean that um, asylum seekers who arrive by boat are sent to remote locations outside Australia. And towards the end, I'll also consider what implications there might be from Australia's approach for other countries, uh, perhaps for the European Union. So let me start, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and my research. Uh, my research focuses on migration, uh, migration issues, both forced and voluntary migration. Uh, but in particular, a lot of my research and my publications focus on the experience of refugees and understanding um, the development of refugee policy uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and also, uh, I'm very much interested in related issues of citizenship, of social attitudes. Um, so the ways that we can understand the, um, uh, the processes of uh, policy uh, and politics and social attitudes interacting. For example, the way that culture uh, and cultural markers have often a really significant role to play in immigration policy uh, development. Uh, that is how people feel about newcomers and the role that that plays in the political process. The term the lucky country um, really refers to uh, not just migration, but refers to Australia as um, a large resource rich uh, country uh, uh, and, you know, geographic, geographically located in the south um, with an abundance of natural beauty and natural resources. And of course, also, it does refer to the fact that immigration has played such a key role um, in making Australia what it is today. So since the post-World War II period, immigration um, has really been a key part of what's referred to as nation building. That means that large um, numbers of immigrants have uh, been invited to come to Australia, have often been carefully selected um, according to different criteria and that that immigration is broadly and very widely understood as really um, having a key impact on uh, economic, social and cultural change to make Australia what it is today. But then of course, if we, uh, if we turn that question to look at what happens to refugees and asylum seekers, it's a very differentiated picture and that particularly for people who arrive spontaneously. Um, so from a European perspective, you would be familiar with people arriving in Southern European states on boats, for example, that is what is classified as a spontaneous arrival. So someone who doesn't have a visa necessarily, who doesn't have tra travel documents, but arrives in a place spontaneously and then asks for protection. So those sorts of arrivals, spontaneous arrivals, uh, have faced very different sorts of treatments in Australia. And I'm, I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. Uh, there are, are, of course, complex reasons that make people leave their homes. Uh, and when it comes to refugees, what we know is that people often don't necessarily choose to leave. They would rather not leave their home, leave their families, leave their culture, their work, education and the life that they know, but rather they're often compelled. So there are reasons that force them to leave their home 
and to seek refuge somewhere else. Uh, and they can be a variety of reasons. So often violence, war, other forms of forced displacement. Um, more recently, also climate change contributes to the fact, what, what we call push factors, the, the factors that push people away from their homes. When it comes to refugee populations, um, what we know is that various forms of persecution, um, political, social, and other forms of persecution, religious persecution, uh, are the, often the drivers to make people flee their home, often in fear of their life. In terms of source countries, uh, a, a country such as Australia receives refugees from many, many parts of the world. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment in more detail, because of course there are um, various ways that refugees arrive in different countries and arrive in Australia. Um, and in Australia, the way that you arrive makes all the difference in your outcomes um, and your entitlements, which is a, a picture that's a little varied to what happens in other places, but I think we can also reflect and learn uh, what the, perhaps what the positive and also what the negative aspects are um, uh, in terms of what occurs in Australia. So the Pacific solution is a, uh, is a term that was coined in 2001 and is an approach that's been used at various periods since that time, so for quite a period of time. And what it means is that um, at that period in 2001, the Australian government chose to close its borders to asylum seekers arriving by boat and uh, to mandate that anyone who seeks to arrive by boat uh, may not enter Australia in order to uh, put forward a claim for protection under the International Refugee Convention, uh, but rather that Australia would send those people to third states for detention and for processing of their refugee claims. So that's the beginning of what is labelled Pacific Solution. And Australia at that time, in 2001, struck agreements with two Pacific Island nations, with um, Papua New Guinea and with the island state of Nauru. And two sites became sites of detention um, and uh, what the government labels the processing of refugee claims. And those two places are Manus Island uh, on Papua New Guinea and the island state of Nauru. Both of those places are very remote. They're a long way from the Australian capitals. They're a long way from legal representation, from advocacy organisations, from human rights organisations. And they're also a long way from the Australian public from the scrutiny of media. It's expensive to get to those destinations. Um, and notably, both of those uh, destinations are also very poor, um, uh, less developed countries and societies. And so Australia struck a deal whereby it pays those governments uh, to do the work of detaining um, asylum seekers and Australia is involved in that process so um, uh, has subcontracted private organizations to run those detention centers um, which is another complicating factor when private for-profit organizations are involved in administrating um, detention centers and running detention centers. So what we know, and again, the information uh, ha has been over time difficult to glean. You know, how do you get good, reliable information when these centres are so remote, um, when journalists have not been permitted um, for, to go to those locations, they um, um, cannot avail permits, visas, um, 
so often the only scrutiny of these detention centres has been through international organisations such as um, the United Nations High Commission of the Refugees, um, which has a mandate to be able to go and to visit. So it's very hard for the uh, Australian government or the Papua New Guinea government to deny entry. Um, and some human rights organisations have managed to go. And so what's been pieced together over the years um, are that the conditions in Manus and Nauru are um, harrowing for the detainees. And those, when I say harrowing, it's not so much uh, that people would necessarily highlight um, uh, everyday life, lack of food, uh, heat, cramped living conditions, all of those things are absolutely there. But what um, the refugees that are in those detention places, what they have highlighted, what they have reported back, what they tell us when they um, are able to connect with people in Australia through mobile technologies. Um, and at various points, mobile phones have also been banned and taken off people. But at various points, news has got out, um, people have had access to mobile phones and mobile technology. And what they tell us is it's the indefinite nature of their detention um, that's the most difficult. In other words, it's the, um, uh, the mental health effects of this form of detention when there is no end in sight. So Australia doesn't give um, uh, refugees that are detained an idea of how long they will be detained. Um, it is, it, it can be an unending process. And so, for example, the, um, the men and boys detained on Manus Island, Nauru was also a place where um, uh, women and children were sent. Uh, but men and boys have been detained on Manus Island, for example, for uh, seven plus years without resolution. And that's even after they were found to be genuine refugees so that they were availed the legal process as Australia is obliged to do and found to be genuine refugees. Many of these um, uh, refugees were from um, places such as Iran, um, Sri Lanka, many other countries that we know are refugee producing. Uh, so even after they were found to be refugees, they were detained. And the reason for that is that uh, Australia uh, instituted policies along with this specific solution, along with um, offshore detention, uh, instituted policies that say that no person who arrives by boat in Australia or attempts to arrive by boat, many of them are intercepted by naval vessels on the sea, on the high sea from traveling from Indonesia, for example, to the north of Australia. And so the policy says, anyone who attempts to arrive by boat will never be resettled in Australia. So this is this um, strong punitive surveillance oriented policy that wants to send a signal to say, do not attempt to come, do not attempt to, to claim asylum here. You won't ever be able to enter Australia. So there are, for example, some people, some men who attempted to arrive by boat in 2013, uh, who were sent to Manus Island, uh, who, have, who were there for six or seven years, who had families already in Australia. And the rule says that those men, even if they have family here, will never be able to settle, will never be, even be able to come on a visitor's visa. And so what we've seen from this policy is that um, uh, in the recent past, uh, last year, for example, is one man, um, his name is Bayrouz Bachani, who, <clears throat> excuse me, who is an Iranian, um, a, a Kurdish Iranian refugee. Uh, he 
has now been resettled in New Zealand. He lives in New Zealand. He has a protection visa there. Um, he was found to be a genuine refugee many years ago. Another young man that I met when I visited Manus Island last year, uh, who is Sri Lankan, uh, has now been offered a resettlement place in Finland. So after spending almost eight years in detention uh, in Manus and then in Port Moresby, he is now going to live in Finland. So this is the sort of indictment that this policy has on Australia, where other countries are now resettling uh, individuals who are found to be refugees. As countries that have signed a refugee convention, such as Australia, are obliged to do. So in other words, refugee policy as an international pact between nation states is undermined by the sorts of things that Australia is doing. Because imagine if other countries did similar things, uh, genuine refugees would not be able to find a home where they can then settle and live and work and study as they want to do and become fully contributing members of society, uh, they won't be able to be offered a place anywhere. And that's why I think many researchers have really stressed that Australia's approach and Australia's policy is so worrying uh, uh, as a signal to other countries. So let me briefly outline what the white Australia policy is. Uh, Australia, as you may know, was um, uh, settled, um, colonized by the British in 1789. And uh, the land was clearly already settled by the indigenous population. Um, but at that time, the indigenous population was not recognized and it took a long time for the Indigenous population to be recognised. And one of the um, first acts of what's the Federated Parliament of Australia, so when all the different states and territories that make up the Australian nation um, came together in 1901 to form a federation of states, the very first act of the Australian Parliament, the Federated Australian Parliament, was what was what's called the Immigration Restricted Restriction Act, which is euphemistically or popularly called the White Australia. And this policy literally articulated uh, an exclusionary approach to who could come and who could settle, who could claim citizenship, who could become an Australian. And that was based on um, a racialized view of human beings. And so, uh, for example, Chinese had settled in Australia already in the 1800s. They came uh, to find gold. There was a gold rush in the 1800s. Um, Afghan traders were in Australia well before 1900. They were also here in the 1800s, but many other um, ethnic groups from many parts of the world and particularly from the Asia region because of, of course Australia is geographically located um, in that Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific region. And so all of those different ethnic groups were excluded. Uh, many were imported, um, families were separated and that policy of actively discriminating uh, against people based on uh, racialized categories continued until the early 1970s when it was abolished and Australia formally uh, became and understood itself from then as a multicultural society, reflecting the complex uh, makeup of Australian society from large waves of immigration in that post-World War II period that I um, characterised earlier, but also immigration from many parts of the world much earlier than the post-World War II period. 
So there was that change in the early 1970s, but as happens in many societies, when law changes, when policy changes at a particular date in time, that doesn't necessarily mean that social attitudes somehow switch or move along with that change in law, that change in policy. And so I do think that there is a relationship between um, uh, white settler Australians social attitudes that you know the many generations of white settler Australians that are living here uh, their attitude towards um, immigrants who come from different parts of the world because of course what we do know is that uh, the makeup of the refugee population that has come to Australia over the last 30 years or so the makeup of that refugee population, similar to many other parts of the world, are uh, from um, Middle Eastern countries, are from various countries in Africa, uh, um, sometimes from um, Central and South America. So from all of the regions of the world that, are, that we call refugee producing, where there have been uh, conflicts um, and strife and persecution where people flee. And so I think there is a strong relationship between those social attitudes that are racialized, that discriminate on a, against people on the basis of skin color, on the basis of religion, on the basis of um, cultural markers and cultural attenuation. And the validation uh, in Australian society of the very restrictive and punitive refugee policies. In other words, politicians in Australia um, uh, know and have known for uh, a number of decades now that very harsh policies towards refugees are accepted by a large part, not by the entire part, by, but by a large part of Australian society uh, because those refugees come from these other parts of the world uh, that many Australians don't see as part of what Australian society self-understanding is. So yes, the answer is yes, that in that um, post-World War II period, Australia did accept um, uh, large numbers of uh, refugees from all over Europe. And Australia has um, uh, the, the, one of the largest per capita populations of Jewish people in any um, part of the world, in fact. Uh, so the majority of those uh, Jewish Australians came here after the Second World War but some had already um, come earlier. So yes, Australia does have that history. And it's interesting that um, many Jewish organizations do very actively work and advocate for a kind of refugee policy today. Uh, but I think it's also, it's also notable that unlike Europe, which has that um, collective memory of war and of trauma and of the obligation to look after refugees, Australia doesn't have that history and that collective um, knowledge and understanding. I think that also does make a difference. What I would say, um, one thing that's important to, to note and to stress is um, the difference between uh, resettlement intake and uh, spontaneous arrivals. So Australia, uh, similarly to the United States and to Canada and to a handful of countries in the European Union, but by no means all member states of the European Union, Australia accepts a yearly intake of what, what are called resettlement refugees. 
And um, so you probably know that the numbers of refugees and displaced persons globally has escalated in the last uh, few years with the Syrian conflict, but many other conflicts um, and you know new conflicts emerging at, uh, regularly, such as at the moment between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Um, so ref refugee populations are regularly being um, produced, uh, escalating. And so the UNHCR tells us that there are around 70 million pe people in refu uh, refugees or people in refugee-like situations. And each year, those countries that resettle refugees from camps that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR, mostly runs these camps. Uh, each year, the states that say, yes, we will resettle some of those refugees, uh, agree to around, set around about 100,000. So about 100,000 out of those millions are offered resettlement places where they can move to those countries, stay there permanently and build a life. Australia takes around about 12 to 13,000 um, resettlement refugees per year. In recent years, that number went up a little bit. So Australia agreed to take a few, uh, some more Syrian refugees. But in the most recent budget, they began to cut that number by 5,000. Um, so it's around about 12 to 13,000. It has been for the last decade and more. And what Australia does is it says to its population, it says to its uh, domestic Australian public, because we are good global citizens and we take refugees from camps and we give them, we offer them a life here, we've done our bit. And when people arrive spontaneously, when they come by boat, we have to send a strong signal uh, to say, don't come. Don't do it. We're not going to resettle you. We're not going to offer you a place. And that's the dilemma. That's the dilemma that Australia's policy, I think, causes for the rest of the world to reflect on. So if, uh, if Europe and other Western countries adopted a similar approach to what Australia's done um, in opening these offshore processing centres, uh, I think that the refugee system that we currently have would break down because people would just be moved to other states and no one would bear responsibility for them. So, you know, those, those uh, couple of examples I gave you of the, the people that I know, that I met on Manus Island, who've been resettled, one in New Zealand, one in um, Finland, some of the men on Manus Island have now been resettled in the United States in a deal that a former Australian Prime Minister struck with the Obama administration um, before the end of the Obama administration. Uh, so none have come here. And so what I'm suggesting is that if other countries adopted Australia's approach, the whole system that we currently have of working collaboratively and finding solutions, um, finding humanitarian solutions and finding solutions that are based on human rights principles and on international legal principles, those things would fragment and fall away. Well, what I would say is that uh, Australia, just as many countries in the European Union, just as um, the United States and Canada and other wealthy nations in the world have an obligation and they have a high obligation to help to solve um, global dilemmas, including refugee displacement. They have uh, a responsibility to solve other dilemmas that cause refugee flows. So we know that there's a, you know, there's a, a relationship between economic circumstances causing conflict, um, resource uh, uh, conflict over water, over land, um, other basic resources causing displacement, 
causing refugee flows, causing wars that cause refugee flows. So I think we need to look at the interrelationship of what causes people to become refugees in the first place. And I think that um, countries like Australia have a large responsibility. They cannot just walk away and turn their back and say, um, someone has arrived on our shores, we didn't invite them, they're not our responsibility. Uh, uh, I think it has to be a shared responsibility. Otherwise, I think there will be more violence and more conflict. So insecurity of populations leads to insecurity for all. Um, so I think there is, we need to remember that there is a, a real interrelationship globally um, between both the benefits and the downsides of global processes of um, uh, profit making of what capital does. And I think we need to look at those relationships very closely. So in other words, I would say that refugees are not produced out of nothing, right? Refugees, people who need to flee their homes, we need to look at the root causes of what, uh, what occurs in someone's life to make them have to flee. And we can't turn our back on that and just uh, close the door when they arrive and say, I need help. Um, I can't live in my home. I need you to help me. This question addresses a little bit uh, characterization that I talked to you about earlier in relation to Australia's refugee policy, which is the development of uh, uh, this characterization of a good refugee and a bad refugee. So in the Australian context, it's been that those who wait in the queue, that's the political language that's been used, those who wait in the camps, um, the large refugee camps in many parts of the world where people, um, the label that's used is refugee warehousing, where people live in those camps sometimes for years, for decades, uh, uh, that Australia's approach has been, th those people are waiting in the queue and that they are the deserving refugee or the good refugee. And that those who arrive in an irregular fashion, who are labeled as illegal, uh, upset the apple cart, and that they need to therefore be punished. I think we need to remember that that's a false dichotomy, that what the Australian government has done, and hopefully other governments don't look to Australia in terms of its policy development, what Australia's done is try to convince the public, and not all the public are convinced, there are um, many people and there are growing voices who are dissenting, so what they're trying to convince the public of is that uh, there is this false relationship between uh, a, a, a good refugee who's waiting and the irregular arrival, the spontaneous arrival, the people who are labelled illegal, who are labelled as a problem, that somehow they are taking the place of someone who's more deserving. And refugee lives just don't occur in that manner. In other words, it's not a zero-sum game. You know, the world doesn't work like that. It's not as though uh, uh, the pie, you know, I take a piece of the pie and it means that you don't get a piece of the pie. So the world knows, um, politicians know, and the global leaders know that those complex uh, causes of um, flight of having to leave your home, the complex causes, whether it's poverty, forms of persecution, climate change, that often those, uh, those factors are interrelated. And what we really need to focus on are the individuals and the families and their stories and to find solutions for them. And of course, also uh, to find solutions. And this is really a key part of the dilemma, and it's a part that many political leaders don't address, addressing the root causes of why people flee in the first place. 
So in other words, don't just put a Band-Aid on the problem and seek to push people that you don't want somewhere else without looking comprehensively at why are people fleeing and why are the numbers growing and what does this mean for peace and security more generally? So, and I think that's a really important question to end on because some it can feel as though these question, these problems are so immense, the numbers are so immense, and we feel powerless. We feel powerless to know what to do, and we feel powerless to act as though our voice doesn't count. And I think there are many things that individuals uh, are able to do. And so I think one of the key and first things that's really important is for individuals to make sure that they're informed. So be active in your citizenship, be active in your membership of whatever political community you belong to, whatever nation state you happen to have um, residency or a passport in, whatever groups uh, you belong to. Make sure you inform yourself that you know what the facts are um, and that you seek out good sources of information. So I think that's a key part. Um, and then uh, I think there are so many ways to be involved. And we see that in Australia, that despite the picture that I painted, and just despite the fact that, you know, I told you of this narrative, these stories of many Australians agreeing with a very punitive approach, what we've also seen uh, is over the years, are many, many Australians coming together and seeking change and dissenting and being very public. Um, and what's very heartening is that, yes, there's many young people, many students, many school-aged children who are vocal, but there are also um, alliances and organisations such as um, there's a group uh, called Grandmothers Against Detention where uh, these women are very active. You know, they're in their 60s, 70s and 80s and they march, they protest, they, um, they say, not in my name. And they're every day outside some of the detention facilities that also exist onshore um, in Australia. So people are also detained on the Australian mainland. And they're there protesting, using social media, intervening, and so on. So I think there are, at, at many levels, there are always things we can do. Um, and I think it's also very important that we support each other, that um, this work is sometimes hard. And when you hear the stories of individual refugees, it can be hard for us, right? It's a form of trauma that we're hearing um, stories, but those individual stories are important so that we don't uh, have a tendency just to put numbers against uh, the refugee issue, but that we look at individual stories and narratives and allow, find spaces for refugees to talk about themselves and to represent themselves so that we or organisations or advocates or whoever don't always speak on their behalf, but look for those spaces. Thank you.